Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We've got an amazing show today where we have a very special guest. And yet you, yes, you are very lucky to listen to what this guest has to say. I'm, 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 I suppose I'm lucky too, because this is going to be a very fascinating discussion. Listen, this show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday. Well, not every Thursday. It's been a few weeks, folks. It's been a few weeks. There's been some traveling. There's been some adventures. There's been some vacation. But now I'm back in the saddle, ready to rock with the Space Cadets. So we record most Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail to get yourself on the air. We also follow, You can also follow along with our Space Cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to Halifax, England, Boston, London, UK, Howell, New Jersey, Redmond, Washington, Seabus, Ohio, Washington, D.C., Seattle, Washington, and I already said Seattle. No, it was Redmond, Washington, and Seattle, Washington, and do miss Mississippi. That's right. You can follow along. Go to spaceradioshow.com for all the links, for the voicemail link, for the live stream link, for the show archive. It's just, it's all there. So like if you're really, really fascinated by the concept of, of engaging with the, the show live, that is the place to be. Now, speaking of places to be, happy Earth Day, everyone. And I thought, what better way to celebrate Earth Day. Actually, this is a complete coincidence because actually my guest was scheduled like last week, but I had to cancel. Happy Earth Day. The best way to celebrate is to talk about everything but the Earth. And in fact, we're going to talk about life outside the Earth, aka extraterrestrial life. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's guest, Dr. Jason Wright. He's a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State University. And as a member of the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds and director of the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center, Jason works on a variety of problems related to stars, planets, and life in the universe. His work in SETI includes searches for signs of extraterrestrial industry via waste heat, like, say, Dyson spheres, and the development of curricula in the field. He also studies stars, their atmospheres, their activity, and their planets. Jason is an instrument, instrument team project scientist for NEED, a PI of Nexus, and a co-PI of Minerva. Yes, these are all acronyms. And a member of the Habitable Zone Planet Finder team. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jason Wright. I'm the only one you can hear, Jason, so just assume that there's a crowd of people uh, applauding can and welcoming you. <laughs> you can't, you can just, in your mind, just imagine the multitudes. Uh, Jason, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. What is SETI? SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, it's something that I think has a really big popular presence. Everyone you know, imagines that NASA's out there and we're looking for life in the universe and that we're looking for, you know, beings like us that might be able to even communicate with us. Um, but, uh, but really, there, it, it's not a very big field. It's something that started about 60 years ago with uh, Frank Drake, who pointed a radio telescope at the sky and realized that we were capable of sending signals that we were capable of detecting across the stars. So for the first time in the 1960s, human technology could do something that human technology could detect at like five light years away. And that was a really profound realization. And so since then, people have wondered if maybe someone is sending us a signal or doing something else that we might be able to detect out there. And so for the last 60 years, a few people um, have been working on it, but it, it's not a big project. It's not something that NASA really works on. Um, it's been mostly privately funded, actually, for the last 40 years. Um, and, uh, and, but I think there's been a resurgence. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to see all the new activity that's going on, new ideas about how we might find alien technology in the cosmos, um, and uh, new efforts to go look for them. So it's a really exciting time to be working in it. Yeah, you mentioned it's, it's not a big field, right. but like we have things like 
Kepler and TESS and the James Webb Space Telescope that are looking for exoplanets, looking for Earth 2.0, uh, potentially looking for biosignatures in their atmospheres. How is SETI related to, to those pursuits? And, and we have like rovers on Mars and, and the, the, the missions to Enceladus in Europa. Like we're, we're looking for life. How is SETI different from those uh, large projects? Well, philosophically, it's not all that different because we're looking for life elsewhere in the universe and we don't know how we'll find it. I mean, if we're looking for microbes or something, that might be very difficult. Microbes are hard enough to find on Earth, much less, you know, out in space somewhere, whereas a radio signal might be much easier to detect. Um, but practically, like to, to NASA, for instance, there's just a world of difference. Um, NASA, as you know, is spending billions of dollars on, on Kepler and the James Webb Space Telescope and Mars, and maybe we'll go to Enceladus and all the things you mentioned. Um, and in all these ways, NASA is looking, I mean, among other things, uh, for life elsewhere in the universe, for biosignatures, signs of metabolism elsewhere out there. Um, but searching for technology, techno signatures, is not really on its radar. It's, it's something that it was told um, uh, told not to do by Congress in the, in the 80s and then again in the 90s. And it's listened. And even though Congress has stopped telling it not to do that anymore, and in fact, it's kind of changed its tune and said like, you know, maybe you should do that. Um, NASA has just fastidiously avoided that for a long time. And only in the last few years has it started being willing to think about it being willing to say, yes, that might be something to fund. And in fact, just this year, they announced that they are going to fund uh, two small projects uh, outside of NASA uh, to do the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to merge, you know, the philosophical similarities, we're all looking for the same thing, with the practical and funding aspects of, you know, that NASA will be working on technosignatures just as much as biosignatures. Got it, guys. So that's the main distinction between SETI and other searches for life is, is really the signs of an intelligent species, which we hope to find through uh, some sort of signature of the technology that they right. develop. Does that does that assume that any intelligent species uh, like at our level of, of intellectual capacity would develop technology? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of ways that life might reveal itself. And, you know, if we imagine that life is common in the galaxy, which is a very reasonable assumption, it could be true, um, then presumably a lot of it is just impossible to find, right? I mean, if there are, you know, microbes underneath the ice of a moon of a giant planet on the other side of the galaxy, I'm sorry, there's just no way we're going to know that, right? We don't even know the moon is there, much less somehow penetrate the, I mean, we just won't know. And so, um, you know, life has to do something obvious for us to detect it. Now, one thing could be it alters the atmosphere of its planet, the way that Earth's biosphere has fundamentally changed Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere has oxygen in it because of life. Earth's atmosphere has methane in it because of life. It has ozone in it because of life. And so if we were to see similar spectral fingerprints of similar gases on a planet, that might be a way that we can detect it. Another way is if it were to detect, de uh, develop technology, any kind of technology that was bright enough, loud enough, big enough, or world altering enough for us to detect, that's another way that we could detect it. And so it's all about the different signatures life might produce. And we don't know which ones life does produce out there, and we don't know which will be most obvious. But we know technological life has arisen here on Earth, and we know that there's almost no limit to how obvious it could be. Whereas non-technological life, there are kind of limits. It's not really gonna leave its home planet. It's not gonna create really loud radio signals. And so there's the potential that it's techno signatures that we will find first because they're more obvious, maybe more ubiquitous uh, and maybe easier to find than biosignatures. Wouldn't that, uh, I, I totally see your point. Wouldn't that be somewhat mitigated by the fact that presumably, and again, we're just guessing here because we oh, only yeah, have sure. one example here on earth, uh, but that perhaps intelligent life is much more rare than mm -hmm. microbial life. And so sure. you're cutting down the probability. So even though they might be more obvious, there's fewer of them. But uh, are you suggesting right. that the the techno signatures might be loud enough and bright enough and obvious enough that even though they're much rarer, 
we probably statistically or hopefully have a better chance of catching them. Yeah, that's one way that, that SETI might succeed before um, the search for biosignatures. If, as you say, they're rarer, but they're more obvious. So for instance, if you go outside and you look for life, the most common kind of life around you is microbial life, but you're not going to see it. You can look all you want. You're just not going to see it. What you're going to see are the very small number of species that are big and obvious, the trees, you know, the dog or whatever. Those are the only ones you'll notice. And so that could be the situation. Um, but just because intelligent life is presumably rarer than non-intelligent life, because you need non-intelligent life before you get technological life, Technological life has a different advantage, which is that it can spread. So for instance, if you were looking at the solar system for signs of life, um, you would look at Earth and okay, for most of Earth's history, it was just non-technological and now it's technological. If you looked at Mars, you would only see technological life. Mars is, Mars is entirely inhabited by robots and they give off radio signals. And as we move through the solar system, that's going to become true of more and more of the planets in the solar system. So if you were looking at Earth from a nearby Earth, the solar system from a nearby star in a thousand years, then most of the targets you picked in the solar system and said, is there life? Technology is the only thing you're going to see because we'll have technology throughout the solar system by that. And of course, technological life could also spread among the stars. And so we don't think it it's possible, but it's unlikely, I think, that biological life could spread through the galaxy on its own. Technological life could. So you might only have, say, a hundred or a thousand or a million places where life first arose, but you could have a billion places where there's technology. So in principle, technological life could be much more common. What would be, if I were an alien looking for humans, mm -hmm. At our current, like what we've emitted, how, how we've changed uh, um, the Earth's atmosphere, how we've sent probes to the planets of our solar system and beyond our solar system, what is our own techno signature in the galaxy? How, how would aliens best find us right now? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually really understudied. Surprisingly, this is, um, we only have rough guesses because we haven't worked it out really exactly, although this is a project some people are working on right now. Um, the, the most obvious thing, the thing that we could detect best from the nearest stars is our radio transmissions, our very loudest radio transmissions. So when we um, send radar signals out into space to measure, say, the distance to the moon or the distance to a nearby asteroid or the distance to Venus. Um, those are extremely powerful and we send them straight up into space. Those we could definitely detect at nearby stars. There is a new radio. Oh, what do you mean by nearby? Sorry to interrupt, but what do you mean oh, by the very, nearby? Oh, let, yeah, let's get some scale here. So the very nearest stars are about four light years away. So by nearby stars, I mean like within 10 light years. And I mean, we're talking about the nearest dozen stars. And so for scale, you know, we have new horizons that it just went 50 times the distance mm -hmm. between the earth and the sun, 50 of those units away. Um, if, it, if it did that for another um, 100,000 times, that's what we're talking about to get to the nearest star. So these are, these are truly interstellar distances. On the scale of the galaxy, it's just that little but you are here. Not very interstellar. <laughs> That's right. But it is, it's still, it's, you know, it's interstellar distances. So at those kinds of nearest interstellar distances, um, uh, we could detect our loudest signals. Now, we have new radio telescopes coming online. There's a project called the Square Kilometer Array, which hopefully will be completed in the next few decades. And it will be able to detect not just these strong, powerful, directed transmissions, but just the general kind of aircraft radar that we're always putting out just because we have planes. And at that point, we're detecting not these deliberate signals, but just the passive activity that we're always doing. And uh, that's what kind gonna, of distances for something like the SKA? Yeah, it basically the very nearest stars. And Got so um, you can imagine that as humanity, as our technology becomes bigger, right? As we start getting, I don't know, aircraft radar on Mars, <laughs> as we start, you know, needing interplanetary radar to manage all of our spacecraft traffic or whatever it is. Um, one can imagine that we might become much more obvious in radar. And that means, uh, and our telescopes will become more sensitive. And so the distance at which we'd be able to detect ourselves is gonna grow very rapidly. And so if there are other planetary systems with a lot of radio chatter, 
that um, that's something we could detect. So that's probably the most obvious. A less obvious way is probably um, something like the chlorofluorocarbons in our atmosphere. Those have to be technological. They do. They are not made naturally. Um, and so if there's some alien telescope looking at the earth, measuring its atmosphere, it's like, okay, oxygen, methane, cool, cool, there's life. What is that stuff doing there? That should not be there. That's impossible. There must be factories. There's no somewhere. natural mechanism. There's for no it. natural mechanism for chlorofluorocarbons. That, that has to be intentional. So... Uh, going back to this discussion about radio, you know, you mentioned that uh, we could, you could imagine a alien civilization that is a ten thousand year advance on us, and they have, they have the, they don't have the square kilometer array, they have the square like a thousand kilometer array, like they've, right. they've got the best, and um, and there's actually completed on time and on budget, all right, and <laughs> so they develop theirs, and yes, in principle they could detect our air traffic control emissions from, you know, 10,000 yeah. light years away. If the galaxy were completely silent in the radio, if no stars were blowing up, if there were no solar winds, if there's no magnetic field. Um, so the, here's a question from a space cadet and something I'm curious about too. This is from Edward Hinton, Hinton. How do you go about deciphering an alien signal? How do you know if you're just receiving distant radio emissions how do you know it's an actual artificial signal and not just some random junk from the galaxy? And how do you separate those two? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something we, we think pretty hard about in this. So some things that we look for, some techno signatures are just gonna be inherently ambiguous. If we see something like a Dyson sphere, it, it's just gonna be a lot of infrared radiation. And so how we interpret that will be about, well, is, you know, can we rule out natural explanations? For radio signals, actually, there's very little ambiguity. And the reason is that technologically generated radio signals don't look anything like natural radio signals. Natural radio signals are always spread out in frequency. So most of the backgrounds we worry about, like the plasmas in the galaxy and stuff, basically emits at all frequencies. And so that's just this kind of static in the background. There are some more coherent sources that only emit at a couple frequencies, but those gases move that, that generate those radio signals. And so even those have a spread from Doppler shifts of frequencies. Whereas technological radio signals are extremely uh, precise in their frequency by like a factor of a thousand or better over natural sources. And so that's the primary way to distinguish is that when you look at the spectrum, the, the range of frequencies being transmitted, it's a very unnatural spectrum. Either it's all concentrated in one wavelength or there are sharp edges. Basically, when we see radio signals from Earth, when radio astronomers look at the sky and they are looking for radio signals from space, they're never confused by radio signals from Earth, except in a few very rare cases. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's surprisingly not so much of a problem. It's, it's more a problem of there's this background static all the time and is the signal you're looking for strong enough to come up above the static? But if it is, it's got to be technology for the most part. Got it, guys. So the key is always like beating the background noise. Otherwise, it, it, it is a, a, artificial signals are um, are distinguishable from natural origin galactic signals uh, as long as they are stronger than the the noise background. Exactly. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, Chris Luke, another space cadet, wanted to, to push back a little on this uh, assumption about how common is life. Like when we look back in Earth's own history, as far as we can tell, life only arose once and intelligent life only arose once. So even on our planet where it did happen, it doesn't look like it happened multiple times. Uh, in our billions of years of history, we're, as far as we can tell, we're the first ones to be intelligent. So... Again, like like, just how common is this uh, is life, and then how does the the failure of SETI let me use that word carefully uh, turn into a success in terms of like putting bounds and restrictions on the commonality of life out there? No, those are really good questions. All right, so uh, so the first one um, uh, was about how it looks like life only started once. Um, that's probably true. Now, there's the possibility 
that it started many times and that one of those episodes of abiogenesis just took over and outcompeted the rest, right? I mean, we look at all the species that ever existed, only some are still here. It's possible there were other, that it, that it tried multiple times and one succeeded. Um, that said, I think most biologists subscribe to the idea that there are certain hard steps. There were certain things that only did seem to happen once, like the formation of eukaryotes, for instance. Um, and so it is possible that it's very rare. Um, on the other hand, life seemed to have started on Earth very early. It didn't take, you know, two billion years for life to start. The oldest rocks and minerals uh, that we have on Earth show evidence that life was already active at the time. And so um, I think a lot of biologists suspect, although of course this could be wrong, it's an assumption, um, that it's easy to get life started in the sense that if you have the right conditions, it's going to happen. Um, but that complex life, and we have to use that kind of carefully, um, but say, you know, life similar to eukaryotes that can be macroscopic and differentiate cells and have coordination among the cells, that that might be rarer. And that's entirely possible too. Um, but of course, this is also something that affects the entire search for life in the universe. If life is rare, then it's gonna be hard to find. Um, and so, uh, right, it's unclear. But again, like I would say, once life is technological, that could be its own opening to become quite common. Now, the second question is really important. Um, I like to, to uh, analogize SETI with the hunt for dark matter. So we know there's something in the universe that's doing a lot of gravitating because we have a lot of ways to measure gravity and there's something doing gravitation that we don't see. It's dark in the sense that it doesn't shine light. And uh, a lot of physicists suspect that it's some sort of undiscovered subatomic particle that's all throughout the universe. That seems to be the explanation that makes the most sense. So we have good reason to think this stuff exists, although we've never actually seen one. And so we want to find out what it is. And so they say, well, maybe it's this particle. And then they build experiments to go see if they can detect that kind of particle. And when that experiment doesn't detect it, they're like, all right, if, if it's that, we need a more sensitive instrument and then a more sensitive. And you can never prove it doesn't exist. You can only show if it exists, it must be less massive or interact less than this threshold. And so we go and we look, so we got to find this thing. And we really think it should be out there. Um, but, you know, there's no shame in not finding it. It could just be smaller and we got to look because we want to know. So in the same way, when we look for life in the universe, we actually have a leg up on the dark matter people because we know life can exist. We have an example here on Earth. So we know we know this does happen. The question is just how often it happens. And that's what we're trying to do. And so the problem is we don't know what form it will take. Just like with dark matter, we don't know exactly what form that particle will take. And so we have to guess. Maybe it will take a form that does this and makes this techno signature. Maybe it does this and makes this bio signature. And then we have to search as many places as we can for that signal. And then hopefully we can start to say less common than this, less common than this. And just like the dark matter folks, rule stuff out. And you know, we might be at it forever because we're alone, but you never call off the search because it just might be, you know, around the next corner. So speaking of calling off the search, uh, Viso Tutti is asking if SETI had infinite money. Here we go. <laughs> Dr. Jason Wright, you are yes. now in charge of all SETI work around the world, and you've been given a budget of infinity dollars. Mm -hmm. What are you building? I am building a community that's going to figure out what to build. What's happened is that we have only thought about this a little bit. It's mostly a hobby for most people. Um, radio searches are pretty sophisticated now. There are way more ideas on things we can look for than things we've actually tried. And so, like if NASA said design the mission to do SETI, I'd say, you know, when we build the James Webb Space Telescope, that's building on decades of heritage. When we design, you know, how we're going to look for life in the universe and biosignatures, that's a field that NASA has invested in for decades with hundreds of researchers from biology and chemistry and geophysics and astronomy and thought really hard about the best way to do that. And they've come up with a plan that can justify like a $10 billion mission. And we need to do that in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And it's hard when NASA won't fund you to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard when the government won't fund it because that's how American research universities work. We use government funding. And so, um, and so I think we gotta start. So like right now, I'm writing a textbook. 
Like there needs to be a textbook, there needs to be a discipline, there needs to be a definition of terms. We need to train people in it so that they can spend careers on it. So I know it's a cop out, but what I would do is exactly what I'm doing now, which is getting people smarter than me that are passionate about this and ready to spend their careers on it, set on the task so that we can justify, you know, cashing that infinite dollar check and doing something useful instead of just saying, you know, guess. But if I had to, I would launch like maybe guess right now, I would launch a telescope that would search the entire sky at infrared wavelengths. Um, infrared. At, I would because I'm a Dyson sphere guy. I'm not a radio 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 guy. But you know this is this is what I would like to work on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in charge of SETI uh, in this. Right. I want to see, so right. If you use energy, um, this wouldn't be the only thing I do, but if you use energy, um, you can't keep it. Like, you know, the computers we're using are drawing energy out of the wall, but they're not keeping it or they've got hot out. Right. Your computer's getting hot and it's radiating that away. Anytime you use energy, anything, not just technology, you know, sunlight hits a rock, it warms up and it radiates. So energy use Technology uses energy. I want to measure the energy use in the galaxy. And there's a lot of cool astrophysics you can do with that. But also, it would let us look at stars that might have Dyson spheres and find the ones that could have a lot of energy use going on throughout the system around the star. And a put lot some of energy in transfers and transformations and a lot of waste heat. Exactly. And so that's what I would do because that's that's uh, an area that has gotten very little attention and something that I know how to do. Got it. Okay. So so that's next on the list. Uh, and, and that dovetailed nicely with a couple questions from the Space Cadets from Infinite Monkey and Mike Lodge on YouTube. Um, you know, why focus on radio if, if there's other signatures out there? Like might they use gravitational waves to to uh, let make their presence known in the galaxy? Yeah, absolutely. And there have been a lot of ideas. I mean, people have suggested, I mean, you name a way to convey information. And someone has suggested that that might be how aliens communicate. Um, gravitational waves seem kind of hard. You want to generate gravitational waves. It's a very inefficient way to spend your energy to communicate, but it has some advantages. Um, but sure, why not? Maybe neutrinos, maybe cosmic rays, maybe gamma rays, x-rays. Like seriously, there are papers on all of these. Got it. Um, and, and so um, I would love to search all of those things. So definitely with my infinite dollar check, I am you know, also working on all of those other things. Radio gets the most attention because it was first and because, um, because that's what the billionaires think might work. So first Got it was it. Barney yeah. Oliver, the HP executive who saved SETI when in his will, he endowed the SETI Institute. So when NASA said, that's it, we can't do this anymore, no more funding, Barney Oliver's estate came along and said, all right, let's 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 keep this program going in the radio. And then Paul Allen, he donated millions of dollars to keep that project going and look in the radio. And now Yuri Milner has come in with $100 million to continue it. Although he has also expanded into the optical looking for certain kinds of lasers as well that might be out there. And so, um, and so that's the other thread that doesn't get as much attention because it wasn't in the Carl Sagan movie, um, but it's also been going on for a while. It's looking for lasers, which are also a very good way to communicate at interstellar distances. Do you, uh, shifting tracks here for the last bit of the show, um, two related questions. One, do you feel like SETI research is is maligned in, in science? It's definitely not mainstream because like you said, a minority of scientists and uh, astronomers are working on SETI. Is it is it disparaged and maligned or is it just one of the many, many minor uh sub 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 branches of astronomy uh that question and then and how does that connect to the public perception and the the media hype and news cycle every time there's some signal that we don't understand or a rock comes flying into the solar system and yeah. immediately we start talking about aliens like is that helping or hurting what you're trying to do i think it's a mixed bag on all of those points and you're right about the media attention um i mean working in this field um, I mean, every time I write a paper, there's a news story about it. Like people are just so hungry for news that, you know, everything we do, every city conference, every city paper is like, you know, someone's trying to turn it into a news story. So that's, you know, working in a fishbowl like that, you kind of have to be very careful about what you say. 
Um, and then in terms of how it's perceived by our, by my peers, you know, in the field, it's again, a total mixed bag. There are some people who um, just really think it's not scientific, that it's basically a bunch of UFO fans that are trying to drag UFOs into astronomy. Um, there are people who are, you know, skeptical, but once you explain what you're doing, they're like, okay, that makes sense. That's really cool. Um, there are people who would love to get involved and are totally supportive, but just have no idea how they can help. And all, and uh, and then there are people who just, you know, are like, okay, this is a thing now I'm in, how can I write a paper on it? Um, and then, except for the first case where they're just dead set against it, in all cases, it's helped by education and, you know, telling them what the field can be. And unfortunately, you know, it, it, it hasn't really defined itself academically yet. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't proven its rigor. And a lot of the work that's been done has been kind of out there. Um, and so, you know, it's important to lay down some standards and draw people in and define things. And so that's, that's why my big project is turning it into an academic discipline. So that, you know, when people are skeptical about it, I can point to rigorous research being done. In that way, it's actually very similar to where the hunt for biosignatures was, say 30 or 40 years ago. When Carl Sagan was popularizing astronomy and talking about how, you know, it's about humanity's place in the universe and whether there's life out there, a lot of astronomers were horrified that he was like trying to drag all this woo-woo stuff about aliens into this very sober physics discipline of astrophysics. And, uh, and so, you know, he was not taken seriously by a lot of astronomers. And now astrobiology is like, you know, it's like a, a third of what NASA does in astronomy or something. It is totally accepted. And so I think SETI is next, that we're going to get drawn in in that same way. But it's going to take that same proof. Like We're going to have to do the hard work of showing we're doing serious science and you know, give our colleagues you know, something to look at and address their concerns and, and, and come on board. Yep. A similar position to what cosmology in my own field was in like 100 or 120 years ago, where it started off very nebulous, very like, let's talk about the origins of the universe. And everyone's like, are you serious? Right. Uh, and then we actually get data like the cosmic microwave background and we have the uh, Friedman equations. And then all of a sudden we're doing precision cosmology and discovering dark matter and dark energy. And now it's like a third of what NASA does. So, so exactly. uh, best of luck to you. Very last question before we go. The aliens have made contact. We've done it. And it's it's taken like 100 years to exchange messages, the whole deal. Okay. But they have decided they want to sample uh, our finest cheese products. And you are leading the committee of the alien uh, communication project. And they hey. said, okay, Earth, what do we got? And everyone's looking at you. So, Dr. Jason Wright, what's your favorite kind of cheese? What are you going to send off in the little capsule to the to the aliens? Yeah, well, I feel like I feel like we've got to uh, we have to cover our bases because we don't want to offend them. So, uh, I feel like we got to like represent what kind of cheese people like. And I've got two kids, so we always have cheese in our in our fridge, which is bad because I'm always eating it. <laughs> it's not bad. And so like a nice good slice of like Colby Jack, I think, because who doesn't Colby like it? Jack. I mean, how Midwestern of you. I love it. I'm from Ohio. Just, so like Colby Jack is my childhood. Like nobody can object to Colby Jack. It's like one of the, anyway, so Colby Jack, we got to send one of those. But of course, you know, we also need to show that we have some sophistication in case they're like, Colby Jack, come on. Is that all you got? Right. So I'm thinking a nice wheel of some Humboldt fog just to like, Ooh. I think that would be okay. i think that would it would Fine. say a lot of lovely us. you know what okay if that's what you want put in the container and hope that they don't decide to eradicate us based on those samples uh the fate of humanity is in your hands and so i thank you for those selections uh how can people follow along with your research and not the the news media quote over hyped amplified like the actual I research that you're doing how can people follow along yeah, so um, I have a, uh, a Twitter feed at Astro underscore right. Um, and then the Penn State Center for Extraterrestrial Intelligence also has a website and Twitter feed. Um, and that one is probably a little more focused on uh, SETI and, and cool astronomy and not so much like, you know, what my kids are up to. Um, and so I think either of those would be really good. Also, um, the Berkeley SETI Research Center uh, which is where the Breakthrough Listen SETI program is going. They have a great Twitter feed about, you know, all things radio and SETI. So um, uh, th th that's what I would do. And then, yeah, the Peace SETI website at Penn State, uh, if you want to see all the latest research we're doing. 
All right, so Nancy's very helpfully putting those links in the chat. They will also appear in the show notes. Uh, Dr. Jason Wright, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a wonderful conversation. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. All right, I'm going to go eat some cheese now. Take it easy. All right, you do that. <laughs> All right, that was a very cool conversation with Dr. Jason Wright. Uh, we chatted a bit before the show aired, and we know, like, we disagree with each other on some things, and that's okay. And that's okay. And I'm not saying it's never aliens anymore. I'm done saying that because it's, that's that's not exactly right. And so that doesn't represent a, a properly skeptical uh, evidence-based worldview. So I don't say it's never aliens anymore. I, we're done with that. Uh, but the Kraken is still going to come on for some while. If, if wild claims are made, the Kraken will still come out. Don't worry. I need to eat some cheese because that was a fun... Oh my gosh, this cheese. It's all wrapped up and it smells like a French supermarket. Oh, this is uh, a Germain from France, from Marjorie Germain. It is a triple cream. It just is. It's like right there. It's like, does it, it doesn't like care for labels or, or categorizations. It's just says, no, we make the triple cream and we are done. This cheese it's made from cow's milk, extremely soft center. Its softness is explained by the addition of cream to the milk during the production of the cheese. So they like, yeah, I mean, come on. It won a World Cheese Award in 2018, won gold medal. Oh my gosh. And this is, I'm going to, I know the whole house is salivating. Oh, wow. That is like, that is a cheese. This is a cheese that just like wakes, like like you open it up and it just slaps you and it says, bonjour, <laughs> I am a cheese and I am here and you are going to devour me. Look at that rind. Apparently the rind is very velvety. Wow. This is intense. I'm very excited. It's Oh my gosh, it's like falling apart in the knife. Look at that creaminess. Like they, they didn't joke. Like three times the creaminess level of a normal cheese. Whew. Wow. It tastes like Paris minus the cigarettes. It is just deep and woody and earthy, but it like blossoms in your mouth and hangs around. Like I, it, it like, it like puts a beret on your tongue. It's like, now you are French. Now you're from, oh, oui, monsieur. <laughs> Très bon. Uh, triple cream for, thanks to Dom's Cheese Shop, that's D-O-M-S-Cheese.com for providing this monstrosity of amazingness imported from France and into exported into my mouth. I know that the whole house can smell it now. And, and they're like there, I can hear them. They're like scratching at the door, like zombies, like ready to eat this cheese. So don't worry, family, you're going to get, you're going to get a taste. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for the super chat, Russell. Remember, you can drop a super chat in the live chat anytime. You can also go to patreon.com slash PM. So someone's got to buy. Oh, I get the cheese for free. I get the cheese for free from Dom's Cheese Shop, D-O-M-S Cheese.com. But to keep the show going, please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. That's P as in Paul, M as in Matthew Sutter, like butter, like triple cream, but with an S. I really do appreciate all the contributions. Thank you for joining me. Thank you to Dr. Jason Wright. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. I'm Paul Sawyer. This show is brought to you by you. Go. Thank you, Nancy Graziano, for producing the show, wrangling the space cadets, putting all those links, inter arranging these interviews. Thank you, Nancy. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com for more info. Thanks again, space cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing.